All right. Good morning again, everybody. Great to be with you today. Hey, I just wanted to take a minute and just thank some people here today. If this is your very first time through the doors of Cornerstone Chapel, I just want to say thank you for visiting with us today. And I really hope that you're just having an amazing day here. If you are fairly new, you've been here for several weeks, um, I also want to thank you that uh, you're giving us a chance that you gave it more than one week. Sometimes it takes several weeks to really uh, know what God is doing and where God wants you to be. So thank you uh, for coming back. And if you call Cornerstone your home, I just want to say thank you to you that, man, that you're here, that you're planted, you're committed. Uh, Man, we love you so much. Um, And we have an amazing church, man. So many amazing people make up this, this congregation. I also want to take a second and just thank all those that are joining us today online. There's a lot of people every week just uh, going to our website, cornerstonechapel.org, and joining in into our service. And, uh, you know, I just want to share a really cool story that I heard this past week <clears throat> from Heather, who uh, is a part of our church family here and her family. And, um, you know, they're, they're here physically, a part of this congregation. And uh, they told me that uh, their, her parents uh, have been joining us online um, for uh, several weeks now, uh, from the south, over 1,100 miles away, and uh, so for Guy and Deb, I just want to say welcome, uh, man, we love you guys, and I just want to say thanks so much for joining us and being a part of Cornerstone Chapel, and man, I am humbled and honored that you would even um, uh, just uh, join with us, so thank you so much. I- I'm just so humbled on what God is doing. So can we just welcome them? Let's just welcome them, all those that are joining. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, hey, we are in a brand new series. We're in week number one of a 10-part series called Rooted, and today we're going to just give, bring a message called What is Rooted? Now, the verb rooted is to be established in and firmly established, deeply and firmly established, but, but what is rooted in our context? Well, for the next 10 weeks on Sunday mornings, we're, we're going to be talking about what it means to be rooted in Christ, and we're also going through this 10-week discipleship experience um, in the context of our small groups that uh, many of you are a part of, and it's going to help us just uh, grow spiritually as we focus on what it means to connect with God and connect with the church and connect with our purpose. And this whole thing about being rooted and going through rooted and being in a rooted small group, it's, it's not a program, it's not an event, it, it's not a, you know, only just a group, it's not a thing that we're doing. I believe it's a catalyst for life change. And, you know, we've introduced rooted discipleship into the culture of our church because I believe God is using it simply as a tool to make disciples and build people. And how many of you know whenever you make something or build something, you need some tools? And God's called us to make and build people for life. And, and God's using Rooted as a tool to do that. And many of you are on this maiden voyage, if you will. You've kind of jumped into a Rooted small group. And, uh, you know, God's going to do some great things through that. And if, if you can't go through Rooted this session, that is, that is okay. Um, you know, I hope that you're uh, able to be in... Uh, perhaps one of our regular small groups that we're offering. And if so, you can actually uh, sign up today to be in one of our regular small groups. We have a table out in the foyer. And, um, but if you can't go through Rooted this time, I hope that in the future you will, you will be able to go through that journey. It's going to be a great, great experience. Well, why, why are we doing this? And I believe it's simple because God has called us to focus on what I believe Um, are the two most important things in the Bible. The two most important things in the Bible is what I just call Jesus' two great statements. Um, He he made two statements that, you know, we label great. One one is the great commandment, and one is the great commission. Two great statements that, that Jesus made. And, you know, the great commandment is this. He said that we are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. 
And so the great commandment is commanding us really to be disciples because that's what it means to be a disciple when we love God with everything, everything in our being, everything we have, everything inside us, everything we hold on to. We love God with all of our heart and we love others that same way. And then the great commission is this. It's, he said to go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teach them to obey not some, but everything that I've commanded you. And so the, the great commandment's commanding us to be disciples, but the great commission is commissioning us to make disciples. And so those are the two great statements. I believe it's the two greatest things in the Bible that God's calling us to. And, and just going back to the great commission real quick when it says we are to go and make disciples, listen to this, baptizing them in water. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I just want to take a time out and encourage you. you it's in your bulletin and you, you heard it on Cornerstone Happenings. If, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior and you've yet to take that next step in your journey of faith, next Sunday we are water baptizing folks. So um, today's the day that you can sign up to do that so we can celebrate with you. Um, and that, that step of your journey that is so important that, that God has, has called us to do. But I believe God's calling the church back to these two basic elements, these two foundational great statements, these things that we are to focus on. And I wanted to read this article that I found that I believe is confirming how God is calling the church, not just this church, but the church worldwide, to, to get back to the, to the basics of focusing on these two things, being disciples and making disciples. Loving God and making followers of Christ. And this article is called Willow Creek Repents. And it's about a church in Illinois called Willow Creek Community Church. It's a great church led by a great pastor, Pastor Bill Hybels. He's uh, written several books. Great man of God. Great church. Um, they, they've been around for a number of years and they were really one of the first churches in the United States that was considered like a mega church, like just huge, but it started just grassroots with a couple, handful of people. Um, and uh, so I wanted to read this article and show you how I believe God's calling us to get back to the basics. Listen to this. Few would disagree that Willow Creek Community Church has been one of the most influential churches in America over the last 30 years. Willow Creek, through its association, has promoted a vision of church that is big, programmatic and comprehensive. This vision has been heavily influenced by the methods of secular business. Outside Bill Hybel's office hangs a poster that says, what is our business? Who is our customer? What does the customer consider value? Directly or indirectly, this philosophy of ministry, church should be a big box with programs for people at every level of spiritual maturity to consume and engage, has impacted every evangelical church in the country. So what happens when leaders of Willow Creek Church stand up and say, we made a mistake? Not long ago, Willow released its findings from a multiple-year study of its ministry. Basically, they wanted to know what programs and activities of the church were really actually helping people mature spiritually and which were not. The results were published in a book called Reveal. Pastor Bill Hybels called the findings earth-shaking, groundbreaking, and mind-blowing. Here's why. Because for so many years, participation was a very big deal. We believe the more people participating in our programs and our activities with higher levels of frequency, it will produce disciples of Christ. This has been Willow's philosophy of ministry in a nutshell. The church creates programs and activities. People participate in the programs and activities. The outcome is spiritual maturity. So what they were trying to do is they were trying to develop a church where they offer all these, a big smorgasbord of programs. And they were hoping the bigger, the, all the programs that they could offer, and as long as people would, would, you know, get involved in these programs and participate, that they would just become disciples of, of Christ. Sounds crazy, but that's how they did church 
by measuring the level of participation. Well, having put so many of their eggs into this program-driven church basket, you can understand their shock when the research revealed that increasing levels of participation and activities does not predict whether someone is becoming more of a disciple of Christ. It does not predict whether they love God more. It does not predict whether they're loving people more. It does not predict whether they're making disciples. Pastor Bill Hybel summarized the findings this way. Some of the stuff that we put millions of dollars into thinking it would really help our people grow and develop spiritually, when the data actually came back, it wasn't helping people that much. Other things that we did not put much money into and did not put much staff to, our people were crying out for. Having spent 30 years creating a, and promoting a multi-million dollar organization driven by programs and activities and measuring participation and convincing other church leaders to do the same, you can see why Pastor Bill Hybels called this research a wake-up call. Pastor Hybels confesses we made a mistake. What we should have been doing all along is when people accepted Christ and became Christians, we should have started right then telling them and teaching people how to take their next step in becoming disciples, how to have a responsibility to be self-feeders. We should have gotten people, taught people how to read their Bible between Sunday morning services, how to do spiritual practices much more aggressively on their own. In other words, spiritual growth doesn't happen best by becoming dependent on elaborate church programs and activities, but through the age-old spiritual practices of prayer, Bible reading, and relationships. And ironically, these basic disciplines do not require multi-million dollar facilities and hundreds of staff to manage. Amen? I believe this is something that God is doing around the world to get churches, to get the church to go back to scripture. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say when he walked this earth? The greatest thing we could do is love God with everything we have and love people. That's being a disciple. And before he left this earth, he said, and I'll give you one more great, the great commission. Don't forget, to, don't just keep it to yourself. Multiply yourself into others. Invest into others. Reproduce yourself into others. Leave a legacy. You're a disciple, make a disciple. Be disciples, make disciples. That's what I believe Jesus is calling the church to do. He's called, he, he did it 2,000 years ago, and I believe that the two greats don't have an expiration date on it. I believe he's still calling us to do it today. What is a disciple? Well, we use this phrase called a fully devoted follower. And I love this definition, fully devoted follower, because it's kind of two parts. It, it begs the question of who are we following? But watch this. It also gets us to ask ourselves, how are we following? And see, a disciple, that word disciple, a fully devoted follower, is not just um, you know, confined to the context of spiritual conversation or church, um, you could be a disciple or a, a fully devoted follower of anybody, of anything. Um, you could be a disciple of a certain political movement. You could be a disciple of a rock band. You could be a disciple and fully devoted follower of a video game. You know, you can be a disciple, fully devoted follower of anybody, anything, and so this phrase gets us to ask the questions, who am I following? And once I decide that, how am I following? And so are we following Jesus Christ? Am I following Christ or am I following somebody else? Am I following my friends? Am I following my career? Am I following a materialistic object, money, am I, you know, et cetera, et cetera? Who am I following? What am I following? I, I believe many of us in this place today, you know, we, we've chosen, we want that to be Jesus. We want to be disciples of Jesus. 
So if we've chosen to follow Jesus, then we have to ask ourselves, how are we following Jesus? You know, are we following him half-hearted? Are we following him just not all in? Are we following him conditionally? Like, well, God, if you do this, then I'll do this. Are we following him cautiously? Difficult to trust. Are we following him suspiciously? Or are we following him fully devoted, you know, or, or in a radical way? You know, sometimes when we hear the word radical, we have all these different, you know, visuals or definitions of what we determine that word to mean to us. But I think it was interesting, all, all of you going through Rooted in that, that first couple pages of your book, it's a gray page, it's an article, and it starts to kind of give you the background of Rooted. And in there, um, it talks about the word radical, and as I was reading it, it says, the English word radical comes from the Latin word, listen to this, radix, R-A-D-I-X, radix. And this Latin word radix simply means this, watch this, it means rooted, rooted. The word radical means rooted. So we could say, let's be fully devoted followers of Christ. Let's be radical followers of Christ, which simply means let's be rooted followers of Christ. I mean, let's be rooted in Jesus and, and, and him alone because there's so many other things that we can be rooted in or rooted to that we give our devotion to instead of him. Scripture speaks of this in 1 Timothy, speaks how we can be rooted to certain things of the world where it says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Watch what happens when we root ourselves to something other than Christ. It says some people eager for money or some people rooted to money have wandered from the faith. Wow, notice how things that we can be rooted to can actually cause us to, it creates distance between us and Christ. They've wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This also means when we root ourselves to something else other than Jesus, life doesn't go as well as it could go as if we were rooted to Jesus. Now when we're rooted to Christ, it doesn't mean all our problems go away, but we're walking with the one that gets us through it, amen? So we can be rooted to things of the world. We can also allow roots to grow in our heart that are not of Christ. Look at this next verse in Hebrews 12. It says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Or a root of bitterness. And what this scripture is saying is that there can be things that can be kind of rooted in our heart. Roots of bitterness, roots of sin, roots of pride, roots of fear. All these different things, and it, it causes havoc. It, it causes upheaval in our life. In, in this verse, it says it causes trouble and it defiles many. That means some of the things that could be rooted in our heart not only are affecting us, but it can affect the people around us too. And so we have to really know what, what, what are we rooted to. Are, are we rooted to Jesus, or, or do we really have some other roots growing deep in our heart, but we, it we want it to be Jesus. We want to be fully devoted followers, radical followers, rooted followers of Christ. And I love how Paul put it in Ephesians where he says, I pray that Christ will make his home in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you may have your roots and foundation in love. Whose love? Christ's love. This verse is saying, man, Make our roots in Christ. Be rooted to Christ. In Colossians, he says, So then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. So I want to give you this starting, this starting point today, just kind of this, this, this phrase of how we can kind of define where we're going today. What, what is today all about? And... Just to put it in a one sentence phrase, we're coming up with this. Jesus will always chase me down to ask the inevitable, unavoidable, and confrontational question, who am I following and how? Let that sink in. 
As you're driving home today and you're like, you know, okay, what was today's message about? This is it right here. That Jesus is always going to be chasing us down, asking us that inevitable, unavoidable, confrontational question, who are you following? Who are you following? How are you following? And as that, as we process that question and, 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 and as we serve a God who's so loving and so good that when he does chase us down, he's not chasing us down angry. He's not chasing us down with this scouring face. He, remember that song we sang today? He's chasing us down because of his reckless love. The reason he's asking us that question is not to make us feel crummy. Oh, I got other things in my life and I feel, you know. No, it's, it's, it's because he loves us so much. He wants all of us. And he wants to give us all of him. That's why he's chasing us down, asking us that question. Who are you following? Can it be me? Can, can, can I give you all of me? Will you give, you, will you give me all of you? Wow, what a, what a God that we serve. Calling us to become fully devoted, radical, rooted followers of Jesus. Let's look at our main text today in Luke 9. Because Jesus then tells us how we do this. And it's pretty simple. How we can become that follower that he's called us to be. Let's look at Luke 9. It says, one day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone, and only his disciples were with him. And I think that, man, don't miss what we just read in this little phrase to start it off. You can see already how we, we, we kind of have two camps. Do you see the two camps? One day Jesus left the crowds, and he was hanging out with his disciples. See how there's two camps? Now, it's not that he, he hates the crowds and he loves the disciples. He loves us all the same, amen? He, he died for all, amen? His reckless love goes out to all. But, but he, 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 he started to distinguish. There, there, there's different camps you can be in. You can be in this camp that's kind of, you know, either you're not following him or, or, or you're not all in or you, you haven't really give him, given him all of your heart. You're just kind of in the crowd, kind of dipping your toe. I like, like, like you're, you're kind of in a crowd. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. Doesn't mean like he loves you any less. It's just that's where you're at. But he's always doing what? He's always chasing you down with asking you the inevitable, unavoidable, confrontational question. Say it. Who are you following and how? So he was hanging out with the crowds. I think that shows his love right there. He didn't say, I hate them crowds. They're not following me. Let's, I want to just hang out with my little us four no more disciples. <laughs> Jesus didn't say that. Even though the disciples were hardcore going after him, hanging out with him. Where did Jesus always go? To the people that weren't. The people that weren't. The crowds. The people that weren't all in. Why? Because of his love. He's like, man, can I give you all of me? Could you give me all of you? So he was hanging out with the crowds, but then he goes, okay, now I need to hang out with my disciples. And he said this, but he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you're one of the other ancient prophets risen from the dead. Then he asked, who do you say I am? Peter replied, you're the Messiah sent from God. Cha-ching, you, you, you got it, Peter, yeah. But then he says this, watch. Jesus did not jump up and down, Woohoo! that's who I am, I'm the Messiah, Right after Peter says that, watch how Jesus is not moved by the words of man. He's like, wow. No, he, he says, Jesus warned his disciples. Hey, guys, warning you not to tell anyone this. The Son of Man must suffer many terrible things, he said. He'll be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law. He'll be killed, but on the third day, be raised from the dead. So it's kind of like he's saying, hey, it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's not going to be always like perfect bowl of cherries. You know, like following Christ, you're going you're gonna to have trouble, but, you know, cheer up, I've overcome the world. Amen? Here, here's the thing. Sometimes people think, you know, well, why should I follow Christ? If I follow Christ, I'm still going to, experience troubles. Listen, you're going to experience troubles if you're not following Christ, so why not follow Christ and go through troubles with him? 
That's a much better camp to be in. And it's not that God just loves to pour down troubles on his people. It's not God. It's we live in this world that's been tainted by sin. And he can't wait till the trumpet blows. Doo -doo, and Jesus comes back to take his church out of here. Amen? What a glorious day. But while, until that happens, we live in a big bunch of yuck sometimes. So I'm glad I'm, I can go through the yuck with him. Amen? And he just says it plain and simple. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. That's what I love about Jesus. He's not going to sugarcoat discipleship. Hey, you want to be a disciple? I'm not going to sugarcoat it, okay? Here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Okay? Here's the deal. You want some of this? <laughs> so he says, that's what he says, if you want to be my follower... Here's what you got to do. You got to give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. And if you try to hang on to your life, because, oh, don't we try to do that? I'm going to give God 99% and hang on to this. He goes, you try to hang on to whatever you want to try to hang on to, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Okay? So Jesus basically says, you know, okay, so he's chasing us down, asking us the inevitable, unavoidable, confrontational question, who are you following and how, and then he tells us how to do it. He says, here's how you do it. The first, number one in your notes, it says this. You want to be a calm, a fully devoted, radical, rooted follower of Christ? To follow Jesus, I must give up. Well, give up? What do you mean? Like, I got to throw in the towel? No, 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 no. It's not talking about that type of give up. Not a throwing in the towel give up. It's... Look at the verse again. Luke 9 says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way and follow me. See, that's, that's what Jesus asks us to do. Whenever, back in the day, when, whenever he would ask his disciples to follow him, he always required some type of a sacrifice. There was always a sacrifice involved. Why? Because we're supposed to be, did you know disciples, follower of Christ, we're supposed to be little Christs. That's what Christian means. We're, we're to become these little mini Christ's on the earth. Well, that means we're supposed to be like him. What did he do? We just celebrated it in communion today. He made a great sacrifice, didn't he? And we're to do the same. If we're going to follow him, we must make a sacrifice. We must sacrifice something. We have to give up our own way. There's things we have to die to. The disciples left their nets. They were fishermen. They left their boats. Some had to leave family behind. And there's things that we are being called to give up you know, give up, give, giving up of our own way, our own way of thinking, our own way of doing life, our own way of entertainment, our own, all these, all these things that are either not of the Lord or they don't line up with scripture or it brings compromise into our life or, you know, the sin in our life. You know, sometimes Christians, we're, sometimes we can be good at justifying our sin. You know, there's certain sin that we hate. Oh my gosh, I hate when I sin that way. But there's certain times that we sin and we we, we justify it. We kind of allow that into our life. Like, like sometimes we, we read real quick through certain passages of Scripture. You know, like, you know, oh yeah, I don't like this sin, but, but when the Bible talks about something here, like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, go past that real fast because I want to justify and I want to hang on to certain things in my life. So Jesus is saying there's certain sin, there's certain junk, you know, certain, certain people stuff like unforgiveness and bitterness and how about this, just the pains and hurts of life? Man, church, I know how much sometimes we as believers, we hang on to our pain when we don't have to. We hang on to the hurts of the past when we don't have to hang on and go through life. Listen, I'm not, I'm not belittling it. I'm not, I'm not trying to say it wasn't a big deal. Probably was a huge deal. It was probably very hurtful. I, got, I have my own set of stuff, okay? But it goes back to this. A lot of times we're just hanging on to stuff that Jesus is saying, do you want to be a fully devoted follower? Do, do you want me to be able to give me, you all of me? If you want all of me, some of the real estate is, is t being taken up by the junk that you choose to hang on to. And Jesus is calling us to let go of some of that stuff, not because he's trying to be mean, not because he's trying to be a jerk. Because how, let's be honest, 
in all your kids, have, you know, I guess we're all, we are all kids at one time, right? So, so whether you're living with your parents or not, but do you ever growing up just feel like your mom and dad made certain decisions just to like be difficult? Do you ever think that like, why, why can't I have that? Why are they taking that away? Or maybe you're an employee and you're like questioning your boss, like what? Well, like God doesn't do that. He's never asking us to give up something just because he's, he, he's trying to be a meanie. All that stuff that he's calling us to lay down is stuff that's getting in the way of our relationship with him. It's, it's, it's using up space in our heart. It's using up real estate that he's saying, man, if you want to be fully devoted, I'm ready to pour all myself into you. You got to make some room. And I'm, I'm ready to get all of you. I want all of you in return. You know, the parable of the sower, many of you know this parable, and you know, it's in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it talks about this sower or a farmer who's sowing seed, he's throwing seed, planting seed, and it just so happens it falls in these four different parts of the ground. Um, it, it says, as he's throwing the seed, which represents the word of God, some seed falls on the path. This hardened path, it was hardened because it was trampled on, and because it was a path, the birds loved it. The birds just knew that when seed fell on the path, the birds were just right there to grab it because it was so accessible. And he said, this is like how Jesus is trying to minister to us, and he wants to give of himself to us, but there's birds in our life that are trying to snatch what God's trying to do in our life. And then the rocky ground, it says when the sower was, you know, throwing his seed, the seed, you know, started to spring up quickly, the Bible says. But it says it didn't last long because as the sun came up, it scorched the plant because so many rocks, the roots couldn't get down to get moisture. And then the thorny ground, you know, the seed went out there, and it said it fell down, it started to grow, and said as it sprang up, it says that the thorns started to choke the plants so it couldn't be fruitful. And then this fertile soil, really the fertile soil is the soil that didn't have anything that I just mentioned. It didn't have the birds, it didn't have the rocks, it didn't have the thorns, it just, watch, was empty of all the stuff that steals the life away. And I think this is a beautiful picture of what God's trying to tell us to be fully devoted. It's saying, empty yourself of all the things that can steal and suck what I'm trying to do in you. Get rid of those things. Get rid of the birds, the rocks, the thorns. Get rid of that stuff. Just kind of empty yourself so I can pour in and I can be the sole person that you serve. So we need to give up. We also need to do this to follow Jesus, I must take up, take up. So we need to give up our way, and we need to take up, take up what? Look at scripture. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. So what this means is we give up our way, we take up his way. He has a brand new way for us to live. Whenever God called his disciples back in the day, yeah, they were making sacrifices, but he also challenged them to take up this whole brand new way of living. This brand new way of living. And it was this way of, instead of religion and being religious, it was relationship with Jesus now. So the disciples, instead of going to the synagogue to do all the religious stuff, Jesus said, hey, just hang out with me. Hang out with me. Spend time with me. In Mark chapter 3, the Bible says, Jesus started picking his disciples, those that he wanted to be with. So before the disciples did anything, they were just with him. And that's this whole new way of living. If you want to be a fully devoted follower, yeah, we got to make sacrifices, but we need to start taking up this brand new way of living. Like first and foremost, it's all about relationship with Jesus, spending time with him. It's all about transformation. It's all about life change because that's what happens when you hang out with your Savior and you start to be like him. Then he calls us not just to do one-on-one time with him, but then he starts to say, now I want you to hang out with my body. 
because the church is the body of Christ, and that's called fellowship. When, when we start to do life together and we start to serve together and be in small groups together and, and come to church together and, and see that being with people does the transformation work too, that we're more like Christ because of that. Jesus said, listen, there's a brand new way of living. It's called this, this way of love. He's, he says, just as I have loved you, now love one another. If you love one another, you're really my disciples. It was a brand new way of thinking because they didn't understand that. That's not what they were taught in the Jewish law. You know, so, you know, to, to love, to the spiritual disciplines of, of, you know, like this one, living according to the word of God. The Bible says, if you hold to my word, you're really my disciple. So, you know, we, we have this manual, which we call the Bible, which is our brand new way of living. Many of us, when something happens to us, our, our MO is to, you know, to go back to what our old nature want, used to do. You know, if someone treats us a certain way, our old nature would say this. Our old nature would respond this way. But Jesus is saying, hey, if you want to be a fully devoted follower, there's a brand new way of living. If someone treats you this way, turn the other cheek. Brand new way of living. They're like, oh my gosh, I never heard this before. But that's what it means. Make a sacrifice and give up, but take up this brand new way of living. Hearing his voice, renewing our mind. You know, focusing on making sure we're spiritually healthy, guarding our heart, the Bible says, because the, it's the wellspring of life. Like everything we do just comes out of this, this healthy soul. How about, how about ministry? <clears throat> we're, we're to take up ministry. We're, we're to serve the Lord. We're, we're to know, know our gifts and know our purpose and be actively bearing fruit. The Bible says in John 15, it says, you know, um, this, is, this is to my glory that you bear much fruit. And that's what proves you are my disciple when you are bearing fruit, serving, being generous. How about this one? We're to take up power and authority. Did you know that? When Jesus was calling his disciples, he called them he, he said, I'm calling my disciples and I now give you power and authority. What does that mean? Power over the enemy. Authority over the enemy. Power to do ministry. You know, he, that means this. He, he's given us the, the power to, you know, pray for people. Pray for the sick. You know, to cast out demons. You know, to have authority over the enemy. That means this. That means some of the stuff that's kind of beating us up spiritually we don't have to take that. We don't have to put up with that, church. Jesus has given us power and authority. He's given his disciples power and authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm us. Luke 10, verse 19. And so we need to take that up. You know what? Some of you, you might be young in the Lord. Maybe you've never heard this, but you know, you've never, you never knew. Maybe you said, well, maybe, maybe it's a seniority thing. When I'm a Christian 10 years, all of a sudden I get this authority. No, as soon as you accepted Jesus Christ and you said, I'm following Jesus, he's given you power and authority over the enemy. Amen? And we need to walk in that. You know, we need to walk in that. We, we need to, like, listen to his voice and be ready to obey. You know, if you want to be a fully devoted follower, you got to be willing that you're going to be minding your own business and Jesus is going to mess you up, okay, in a good way. You know, like, like sometimes you ever like, I'm just minding my own business and then I felt God, you know, start talking to me. Do you ever feel that? Like you could be at the grocery store, you could be at a restaurant, and you're like, I'm just minding my own business. I just want to whip through the grocery store, get my stuff and go home. Well, you're whipping through the grocery store and you sense the Holy Spirit saying, hey, 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 whoa, slow down slow down. See that person over there? And you're like, I, just leave me alone. I just, I just want to get my milk and go home. Well, see, listen, Mr. I want to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, right? If you want to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, you got to be willing that the Holy Spirit, if Jesus is Lord of your life, you have to be willing that Jesus has the right to mess you up a little bit because we belong to him. And so sometimes he's calling you. He's calling you at the grocery store. Hey, see that person over there? Just go smile. Can you smile? Can you go like, can you make your facial muscles go like this? Can you do that? Can you do it? I mean, can you smile? Can you give someone a hug? Can you give somebody a ride? You know, can you just pray? Can you go up and just ask? 
hey, can, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? You know, the Holy Spirit's going to going to get into our stuff, and he's going to challenge us to do certain things like that when we're fully devoted followers. Amen? I love this verse in 1 Corinthians 15, because it says, the seed you plant doesn't come to life unless it dies first. And, and this just capsulizes everything we're talking about today, because, you know, the bottom line is God is trying to give us abundant life, that his life is flowing in and through us to others. But see, his life flows in and through us when something dies first. There's stuff in our life that has to die. What is it, Pastor Mark? I don't know. The Holy Spirit's going to show you. When you ask, just ask him. Holy Spirit, what needs to die in me? My attitude, my words, <laughs> what, stuff I'm laughing at that I think's funny that you don't think's funny. You know, uh, just what? what? What do I have to die to? You know, what do I have to die to? And, and, and then, you know, what, what do I need to pick up and take up? What, what kind of life do you want to do in and through me? Great verse, great verse. You want Jesus' life flowing in and through you? Something's got to die first. I want to illustrate this. I want to give you a visual today of kind of what we're talking about. And uh, it's not rocket science, but I just thought it was a good visual. You know, this backpack represents when we come to Christ that you know, we, we, when we come into salvation, our spirit is saved, but man, our soul, we, we just have baggage. We have stuff, you know, we, we have, you know, hurts, pain, sin, habits, wrong thinking, relational issues, addictions, we just have stuff, okay, when we come, when we come to Christ. It's heavy, it's annoying, but see, Jesus is calling us to be fully devoted followers. He's calling us to, 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 that, that we give him all of us so he can give us all of him. So this white shirt represents putting on this new way of living. And I have specifically made it white because white just represents Christ. You know, his holiness and his righteousness. And so Jesus is, wants to give me this, this new life in him and so I'm all ready to, to, to give up and make sacrifices and pick up what Jesus is calling me. And, and I go to try to get this thing on, and, and it's like, man, I, I just, it's just really, really difficult to do both. You know? It just really is. And so what he's calling us to do, he's always chasing you down to ask the inevitable, unavoidable, confrontational question who are you following and how? I want to follow you, Jesus, do you? Then give up. Die. Let it go. And take up the life that he wants to do in and through you. Wow, that works a lot better. Colossians 3 says this. If you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up, be alert to what's going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ and God. He's your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up to the real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. And that means killing off everything connected with that way of death, sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like it, whenever you feel like it, and grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of by God. It's because of this kind of thing that God is about to explode in anger. It wasn't long ago that you were doing all that stuff not knowing any better, but you know better now. So make sure it's all gone for good. Bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, dirty talk. Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and put in the fire. Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the creator with his label on it. 
All the old fashions are now obsolete. So, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense, forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Amen? Let's pray.